You're watching The Legal Breakdown. So Glenn, on the heels of Trump receiving a target letter in the DOJ's long-awaited January 6th case, we've now got some reporting as to what the criminal statutes are listed in the indictment, and uh, there were some surprises in there. Can you discuss what they were? So in the target letter that Jack Smith delivered to Donald Trump, telling him that he is, in fact, a target of the grand jury's criminal investigation into all things January 6th, Jack Smith included three crimes. Now, you should think of these crimes as almost chapters or general topic headings, because Jack Smith ultimately will not be bound by what he put in the target letter. In other words, you're not going to see an indictment that has only three crimes charged. This is designed to put the target of the investigation on general notice of the kind of crimes he may be liable for. So the three crimes that Jack Smith included are one, conspiracy to commit offenses against or defraud the United States, two, uh, witness tampering. We'll get back to that one in a minute. And then three, deprivation of rights under color of law. Now, that's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo there. So let me try to break those three crimes down in layman's terms. First of all, the conspiracy to commit crimes against or defraud the United States. That is exactly what it sounds like. Two or more people enter, entered into an agreement to do wrong, to violate the laws of the United States, to defraud the United States, for example, out of free and fair elections. Interestingly, that's one of the crimes, the January 6th House Committee. Uh, interestingly, that's one of the crimes, the January 6th House Select Committee referred to the Department of Justice for investigation and possible prosecution of Donald Trump. That is also one of the crimes that a federal judge out in California, David Carter, found by a preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not, that Donald Trump and one of his nefarious lawyers, John Eastman, committed. So that one was not at all a surprise. Let's move on to the second one, witness tampering. So the minute I saw that, I thought of a couple of things. One, I thought of witnesses like Cassidy Hutchinson, who, if you'll recall, she had a lawyer who was on Team Trump, somebody looking out for Donald Trump's best interests, not Cassidy Hutchinson's, the client's best interests. And that was early on when Cassidy Hutchinson, by her own admission, was not being completely forthcoming. But then she got rid of that lawyer. She hired a lawyer who had her best interests at heart, and she began telling the truth, including about things like crimes by Mark Meadows, and Donald Trump. So was she tampered with as a witness early on? That was the first thing that came to mind. But then I took a step back and I dug into, you know, the big ugly blue book of federal laws, the United States Criminal Code, and I read the uh, witness tampering federal law in its entirety. And here's what people should know. Just because Jack Smith said one of the potential crimes is witness tampering, when you read that federal statute, there are more than 30 different crimes that are listed under the witness tampering statute. Here is the one that I think Jack Smith may have been referring to when he included that in the target letter, obstructing an official proceeding. That is under the witness tampering statute, and that is a crime that so many of the foot soldiers of the insurrection, the boots of the insurrection, the people Donald Trump ordered to attack the Capitol, fight like hell or you won't have a, a country anymore. Now go down there and stop the certification, stop the steal. Hundreds of them have been convicted of obstructing an official congressional proceeding, the certification of the results of the presidential election. So I think that may be what Jack Smith was signaling when he included the witness tampering statute. And then the third one was a bit of an outlier. I don't think any of us had it on our bingo card. And that is deprivation of rights under color of law. What does that mean? Well, that's a federal law under Section 241 that has been used when people try to fraudulently interfere in an election. For example, there was a case involving stuffing a ballot box with fraudulent ballots, fraudulent votes. What does that do? That actually deprives all voters in that jurisdiction of the full value of their vote. Under the color of law just sort, sort of indicates as a government official, as a government employee. Um, so I, that was a bit of a surprise, but it looks like Jack Smith 
determined that there's enough evidence to prosecute Donald Trump for what is basically an election fraud scheme. It probably refers to the fake electors because he and his criminal associates ended up depriving the American people of the full value of their vote. Now, at the risk of going on too long, Brian, there's one other observation I want to make about these three charges. When I looked at them, I kind of took a step back and I asked myself the question, okay, who are the victims in each of these three charges? And when I answered that question, there was a certain symmetry that emerged. So first of all, conspiracy to commit crimes against the United States. Well, it's in the title of the statute. Who's the victim? The United States of America has been defrauded out of a free and fair election. Look at the second charge, witness tampering or obstructing the official congressional proceeding. Who's the victim? Congress. Look at the third charge, deprivation of rights under the color of law. Who are the victims? We the people. So it makes some sense that Jack Smith captured the three main categories of victims of Donald Trump's crimes, the United States of America, Congress, and the voters, we the people. So that's when it, it sort of fell into place for me when I thought about these three charges in those terms. Now, Glenn, we didn't see uh, any semblance of an insurrection charge in this indictment. Is there the possibility that we could find out that that is one of the charges when Donald Trump appears for his arraignment? The good news is the answer is yes, absolutely. I was a little taken aback when I did not see insurrection included in the target letter for a couple of reasons. One, the, ha the, the January 6th House Select Committee specifically referred the charge of insurrection to the Department of Justice for criminal investigation and possible prosecution because they believed they had amassed enough evidence during their congressional inquiry to support that charge against Donald Trump. So I was a little surprised not to see it. I was also surprised not to see it because I think Donald Trump inarguably incited an insurrection, assisted an insurrection, and has given aid and comfort to the insurrection and the insurrectionists all along. He does it to this day by pledging to pardon the people who attack the Capitol. So, um, and here's the reason I was really disappointed that I didn't see it in there. The authorized punishment in the event of conviction of the three crimes that are included in the target letter that we just discussed, the authorized punishment is a term of incarceration, imprisonment, and a potential fine. But if you're convicted of insurrection, there is one additional punishment that is authorized by law. It's in the federal statute for rebellion or insurrection, and it is a prohibition from ever holding federal office Again, the statute says that if convicted, the person shall be incapable of holding office under the United States. But the good news is Jack Smith is not bound to charge only the three offenses that he put in the target letter. People should know defendants have no right to a target letter. They have no constitutional right, no statutory right, no due process right. It's done almost as a courtesy to say, listen, these are the areas where the grand jury is looking at you as a target. And if you'd like to come to the grand jury and testify and explain yourself, try to convince the grand jury that, no, 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 I did nothing wrong. This is all a big misunderstanding. Of course, Donald Trump has turned down Jack Smith's offer to appear before the grand jury. But the point is, Jack Smith is not bound by those three laws that he included in the target letter. So an insurrection charge could absolutely still be coming. Okay. Glenn, what was your reaction to the statutes listed in the indictment? Did you get any indication from reading this as to whether the DOJ is going soft on Trump or did it feel like full steam ahead for him? Yeah, great question. Well, well, first of all, because I expect an indictment that includes far more than just those three crimes right. in the charges that Jack Smith uh, asks the grand jury to vote out. But I don't think it suggests that Jack Smith and his team are going hard or going easy. I, I view this as Jack Smith and his team determining that the evidence they have acquired, they've amassed, they've obtained over the course of a really aggressive, rigorous, thorough grand jury investigation supports crimes that fall into these three categories. So I don't think it's soft. I don't think it's hard. I think it's precisely what he believes 
he can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. Now, based on these statutes that we already know of, uh, assuming that they're true, uh, what is the sentencing recommendation for you know for for these statutes? How how long normally would someone be sentenced based on on uh, what we've seen? Yeah, there's really no normal when it comes to you know right. in the event a former president of the United States is convicted on these counts or similar counts, how might how long might he spend in prison? But if we look at the statutory penalties, I think they're instructive. So a conspiracy, pretty much any conspiracy, including a conspiracy to commit offenses against or defraud the United States, carries a five-year penalty, whereas obstructing an official proceeding, right, trying to stop the certification of Joe Biden's win, carries up to 20 years in prison. So I think the takeaway, Brian, is that regardless of, you know, how many offenses of conviction Donald Trump ends up with on his criminal resume, he's going to be sentenced to something that is a de facto life term, given his age, and assuming a judge actually sentences him to prison, to incarceration, rather than something like home confinement. Okay. Uh, when would you expect the actual indictment to be unsealed? And just to, for, for note, we're recording this on Thursday. Yeah, so I think what we can use as a guide is the Mar-a-Lago documents obstruction and espionage case. Um, Jack Smith delivered a target letter to Donald Trump in that case, putting him on notice that you're likely to be indicted down in Florida uh, for a series of crimes. And it was a couple of weeks after that when the indictment finally dropped and became public. If we use that as a data point, it could be that we will see indictments of Donald Trump in federal court in D.C. for crimes involving the January 6th attack on the Capitol in the next couple of weeks. But it really is a wild card. Jack Smith could be prepared to drop the indictment in the next day or two, or it could be another month. OK. And finally, when do you anticipate that this case would go to trial relative to the other cases that Trump's been indicted for? Um, I believe the Manhattan D.A. case is slated for March of 2024. And of course, the other DOJ case in Florida is currently uncertain, but no sooner than December of 2023. Yeah, when criminal trials collide, this is a really interesting question. Um, when a defendant has so many criminal cases up and running in the system, systems, both state and federal, who goes first? Well, the general rule of thumb is whoever gets, whoever returns the first indictment is ordinarily, all things being equal, the first case to go to trial. However, I don't necessarily believe that to be the case for a couple of reasons. Let's start with the federal case. The documents trial down in Florida has a lot of built-in road bumps, speed bumps, because of the classified documents and what's called the SEPA, the Classified Information Protection Act requirements that can really um, take longer than usual to, to get a case to trial. The security clearances that are necessary for Donald Trump's lawyers. So even though that case was the first federally indicted case, it could very well be that an insurrection-related case in Washington, D.C. goes to trial before the federal case. You mentioned the New York case. Here is the other dynamic at play. Ordinarily, the feds are the biggest, baddest guy on the block. And when there is a decision as to whether a federal trial should go first or a loosely related uh, state trial should go first, there is almost always consensus. I don't want to speak for the state DAs here, but there is almost always consensus that we're going to let the feds go first and the states are happy to take a back seat to the feds. Why? Because the feds have about a 98 percent conviction rate. And I don't think there's a single state in the country that even comes close uh, to that conviction rate. So, you know, the feds have the big hammer. And if Donald Trump is held accountable in a federal trial, it may very well be that some of his state trials go away, either by the state DA's offering a sweetheart guilty plea deal with no time, because if he's already serving time in, in the feds, then the states don't need to pursue a, a sentence of incarceration, or the, the DAs might just dismiss the case outright because you can only get one pound of flesh from a defendant. Quick question on that. Uh, knowing that any subsequent Republican president may very well pardon a convicted Donald Trump, wouldn't the states, in this case, uh, Fulton County, Georgia, wouldn't the states have kind of a, a proclivity to, to not just give Trump a, a, 
a sweetheart deal with no promise of incarceration? Because isn't that kind of the failsafe if he's ultimately pardoned by some subsequent Republican president? Yeah, it is the failsafe. The other failsafe is electing a president, whether a Democrat or a Republican, who cares about the rule of law and opts not to pardon a criminal former president. Um, but yes, the, the presidential pardon power does not extend to the state. So in the event Georgia wins a conviction or in the event uh, New York state wins a conviction, then those cases would be pardon proof, as at least from the, the perspective of a, of a presidential pardon. Sometimes governors have the pardon power. The good news is the governor of Georgia does not have the pardon power. So here is the other thing that might end up happening if he gets convicted federally. The states might negotiate a plea deal that involves a period of incarceration, but it could be served concurrently with his federal term. So in other words, you know, whatever time he's serving in the feds would also count toward the time he's, he would be serving in the state sentence or the state case. That would be a little bit of a guarantee in the event there was a presidential pardon, because then the state sentence would kick in right. and he would literally be delivered from the Federal Bureau of Prisons to the state authorities to complete his sentence in a state facility. Got it. Okay. Well, obviously, we'll stay on top of all of this stuff and we are uh, full-blown on indictment watch right now, waiting for Jack Smith to unseal this second indictment in the January 6th case, a uh, case we've been long awaiting here. So if you want to follow on top of this stuff as soon as it breaks, make sure to subscribe. The links are right here on the screen. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. And I'm Glenn Kirshner. You're watching The Legal Breakdown.